This lecture is part of the History 363 uh, Modern Africa class at uh, Flagler College. <coughs> uh, I'm Dr. John Young, the instructor. Um, I want to follow up the last lecture uh, where we introduced the concept of legitimate commerce um, and talked about the end of the transatlantic slave trade by turning to a different region of Africa. Um, this is East Africa. Um, the, uh, uh, the coastline of the Indian Ocean, um, comprising modern nations including Ethiopia, Kenya, Tanzania, uh, Mozambique, as well as some, uh, those are all coastal areas, as well as some places in the interior, um, the Great Lakes region, uh, what is now Uganda, uh, Rwanda, Burundi, um, Malawi, and places like that. Uh, so that's the, the region of Africa we're talking about here. Um, and uh, it's quite a different story here than in West Africa, though there are some common themes. Um, this is an area that was touched much less by the transatlantic slave trade uh, than West Africa, which we discussed last time, um, uh, for obvious reasons here. Um, but still, uh, the, Atlantic, the uh, transatlantic slave trade did have an effect on this region. Uh, the Portuguese, um, as we looked at in the last lecture, uh, had established an empire that ran all the way across the continent um, from what is now Angola and parts of what is now Congo uh, in the west, uh, across the continent over to the regions, uh, the region now occupied by the country of Mozambique. Um, and the Portuguese, who were the longest lasting of all of the European slave traders, uh, took slaves from all of those regions, and as the um, uh, transatlantic slave trade declined, as the British uh, and others began to patrol the waters of the Atlantic trying to catch slave ships, um, trying through military means to bring about this moral purpose uh, which they had come to believe in, uh, the Portuguese moved part of their operation to the east and began to um, deal in slaves, or rather capture slaves, buy slaves, transport slaves from East Africa. And so uh, now in the, in the around the 1820s, 1822, something like that, um, Britain secured, uh, or the British Navy secured permission from uh, its parliament, from the government, to patrol the waters of the Indian Ocean and um, arrived at some international treaties that allowed them to do that and so they even tried to patrol this area noting that the the slave trade was ongoing um, but the Portuguese involvement in the slave trade in this region was not uh, the most important factor necessarily um, so the slave trade in East Africa was not targeted at the transatlantic trade nearly as much as it was targeted at the Indian Ocean trade. Going back many centuries, uh, you know, well into, uh, all the way back well into the Middle Ages, uh, this area had been a very productive center um, of commerce um, connected to uh, trade all through the Indian Ocean. One of the primary commodities traded out of this area uh, was, in fact, slaves. Um, but there were other things, ivory, um, some gold, uh, and other products that came out of, uh, out of the interior of Africa and via middlemen uh, traded with Arab merchants who built cities on the coast. You can see some of those cities on this map here. Uh, Kilwa was an important one, uh, Mombasa was another important one, and then the island of Zanzibar as well. Now, um, once the Portuguese came in, they destroyed, initially at least, much of that trade and set it back, uh, took over these cities. And so the very close connection that um, uh, East Africa had had with you know, in Indian Ocean trade stretching up into the Arabian Peninsula into the Persian Gulf area and to points beyond over to India and Southeast Asia um, was disrupted uh, and, and uh, taken over by the Portuguese. Um, however, um, starting in the 17th century, uh, 
Arab political leaders from the Arabian Peninsula um, began to try to reestablish their hegemony over this region and forced the Portuguese out of many of these areas down uh, to the south um, into what is now Mozambique. Um, and in the process, they established a political capital on the island of Zanzibar. Um, so you can see that uh, they also had hegemony over this island called Pemba. Um, and so they really sort of confined themselves initially to these islands out here. However, as we're going to see, they began to make incursions uh, and even to establish permanent outposts in the interior of Africa. Now, you know, we have to think of this at scale. I mean, this is a huge, huge territory, right? This is not a small place. Um, you know, think of a territory like the size of the east coast of the United States here or something like that. Um, maybe not quite so long, but uh, you know, this is a significant territory, and you know, to, to stretch their operations from Zanzibar over here into the interior all the way to the Great Lakes, all the way to Lake Tanganyika and Lake Malawi and Lake Victoria up here, um, was, uh, I mean, this is a, a massive undertaking. Another um, factor that we see in the 19th century uh, is the Suez, the building of the Suez Canal, which was completed in 1869. Uh, which allowed trade, uh, which had previously had to go all the way around Africa to pass up through the Red Sea, through the Suez Canal, and into the Mediterranean. Um, and so this uh, helped to shift the economic thinking of the people of East Africa um, as they became interested in trading uh, via the Suez Canal uh, with Europe, um, with Egypt, uh, with the Mediterranean region. Like much of Africa, another major factor all through this period was internal migration. And some of this was the traditional kind of piecemeal, um, small-scale immigration, or migration, I should say, um, if that's the right term. That had uh, gone on for many, many centuries in Africa, in fact, all the way back to the advent of agriculture in Africa, where people would use... Um, you know, they would clear a, a spot of land, would plant crops, um, or pasture their animals, or both. Uh, in in you know, through much of this region, we have a combined because the the rainfall is high enough. A combined um, agriculture and pastoralism, uh, and you know they would plant crops. They would stay there for a few years until they exhausted the nutrients of the soil and much of the available pasturage for the animals, and then they would simply pick up and move maybe only a few kilometers or a few miles away and start over. Um, now the population density had reached a, a point in some parts of East Africa where uh, it was no longer possible to just find virgin territory, but, but some of that, uh, depending on the region here, was still going on where, you know, I mean, they would find territory that really hadn't been worked uh, maybe ever or maybe in a, in a very long time and continue to clear land. So that's part of it. But there were other migrations that we need to be aware of. For one, there were a lot of Arabs leaving the Arabian Peninsula and other parts of the Middle East and moving down here to East Africa to Zanzibar and, and uh, Pemba and the other kind of major trading centers um, uh, which other Arabs had established in East Africa. And so the, the Arab migration was an important factor. Uh, we're also going to talk about uh, Ethiopia here, um, and that's sort of off of this map. But you can see at the very top of the map here we have um, uh, a people called the Oromo people. Um, these are a kind of wide-ranging group of people. Um, uh, I don't necessarily want to call them a tribe, uh, but they did have a common language. Um, it's one of the it's a, it's a Bantu language called Oromo, um, and this is a very important contact point between the Arab Muslim coast here um, and the African interior. And just to the north up here, of course, we have Ethiopia, which was Christian. This is the kind of quintessential African Christian kingdom. Um, and so these Oromo people were, in many cases, exposed to Islam, converted to Islam, and they moved, they kind of ranged far and wide all through the Rift Valley up here into the Ethiopian highlands. Uh, 
uh, from you know down here into into what is now Kenya, up into up into Ethiopia, and up into the Somali coast up here. Um, and in some cases, these Oromo people were um, uh, a threat to the Ethiopian uh, mountain kingdom. In other cases, they blended very well, diffused into the Ethiopian kingdom. And so that's another example of, um, of migration uh, happening here. So migration is a, a very important factor in East African history in the, in the 19th century. The two main commodities uh, traded in the 19th century from East Africa, or that, that came out of East Africa, were supplied. Sorry for the yawn. Uh, were supplied to other parts of the world were slaves and ivory, and some of these went to Brazil uh, via the Portuguese. Um, as we've said, uh, as Britain and others began to try to shut down the transatlantic slave trade the Portuguese moved their operations, some of them at least, uh, over here to East Africa and began to extract slaves out of the interior um, of, uh, of Africa um, down the coast and from there to Brazil. But, but far more important, as I said before, uh, far more common was that these slaves would be taken out of the interior, uh, transported to, to trading centers like, um, well, we'll talk about these later, but Ujiji here or Tabora um, or uh, Carembe down here, uh, these areas, you know, kind of around the Great Lakes, in some cases even in sort of port cities on the Great Lakes. Um, and uh, from there they would be transported, uh, slaves of course are, are mobile, they're self-transporting, to the coast. Um, many of them stayed on Zanzibar or Pemba, which had rich agricultural land, uh, particularly for the growing of cloves. Um, which became the, the major agricultural commodity produced in East Africa in this period. Cloves were in very high demand uh, all over the world. In fact, you know, there were times when cloves were literally worth their weight in gold. They were that valuable that in European markets and other places they would weigh cloves out, you know, next to, um, uh, uh, to gold pieces, and, and they were roughly equivalent uh, to that. Um, and so these Zanzibar plantations, and also plant plantations on Pemba and, and these other islands, were increasingly important, especially for the growing of cloves. In fact, I think all the way to the present, uh, something like 50% of all of the cloves grown in the world are grown on Zanzibar. So that island is tremendously uh, productive. Further to the north, uh, there were other slave ports, and, and uh, the Ethiopians even, um, though they resisted uh, enslaving people, um, particularly people who were, were Christian, um, there was still uh, an export or rather a, a transport of slaves from the Ethiopian interior uh, from the highlands, mostly war captives uh, gained in the conflict with the Oromo and with other people surrounding Ethiopia up here, um, shipped off to the, the very important slave port, uh, to trading port of Masawa, which is in what is now Eritrea. Um, and there were other slave ports uh, as well um, that were uh, of um, uh, that were important on the East African coast. Uh, we talked about the anti-slave efforts of the of the British um, already, and that did have an effect on certainly the continuation of the transatlantic slave trade. Um, though, as we've talked about uh, before, Portuguese uh, continued to deal in slaves to extract slaves from Africa. Uh, well into the, the, the latter half of the, of the 19th century. Um, but these anti-slave efforts were targeted largely at the transatlantic trade, um, and uh, they didn't necessarily slow down. In fact, they didn't slow down at all. The trade uh, in slaves that were you know, passing along the, uh, the uh, eastern coast here up into the Middle East and from there um, into uh, other other territories into Central Asia, over to India, um, uh, into other parts of Asia. Um, in fact, at its height, uh, the East African coast was producing something like 70,000 slaves a year, which is an incredibly high volume, um, enough to rival anything that had taken place in the transatlantic slave trade um, uh, in, in any one region, at least, of the transatlantic slave trade all through the 18th century when the slave trade was really at its height. Um, and so the slave trade increased 
significantly. Um, and the goods traded for slaves, the, uh, of the goods traded for slaves, the most important by far was the gun, uh, firearms. Um, and uh, as we've seen in West Africa, um, and I mean this is a, a sort of common theme all through uh, every region of Africa, the introduction of firearms, um, which had happened to some extent already, but especially in the 19th century, altered the political balance just about everywhere. Now, you know, we don't want to overemphasize this um, uh, to, to too great a degree. Uh, firearms were not, at this point, uh, at least the kind of firearms that were available in East Africa, were not the effective, you know, kind of military machines that they would become later. We're still talking about uh, flintlock muskets, things that are fairly inefficient. Uh, probably many of them barely worked. Um, but uh, guns were very symbolic. They were meant to cause fear on the battlefield. And if an army was had firearms and the other army didn't, or if there was a significant imbalance in the number of firearms that they had, that could decide the battle because one group might simply decide not to fight. Once they heard the once they heard the guns, they would they would run uh, and hope not to get caught um, and enslaved. Um, and so the introduction of firearms, again, altered the political balance and, and allowed for certain individuals um, to gain great power. If they were able to buy lots of guns and supply their soldiers with guns, they could then um, uh, in turn defeat their neighbors, even establish small or or even large empires and enslave, uh, uh, capture and enslave their rivals. Um, and so this period is marked by a lot of dynamism and a lot of creativity. Uh, certainly, you know, there, there's some charismatic and um, capable individuals who establish uh, large hegemonies in you know, both on the coast and the in, in the interior of Africa. But this is also a tremendously violent period, partly due to the introduction of large numbers of firearms um, into this part of Africa. Um, and so the, the creativity and the dynamism and violence tend to go together. Uh, the other major good, apart from slaves, that was extracted from Africa, at least this part of Africa, was ivory. Scholars talk about the elephant frontier because, of course, ivory is a finite resource. There are only a certain number of elephants. Once you've killed all the elephants, then you don't have any supply of ivory anymore. Um, there were probably tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands uh, of elephants killed in the 19th century for their tusks. Um, this is why so many uh, pianos and uh, you know ha have ivory keys. Uh, the pianos that were built in the 19th century. Uh, why you know if you go to museums that feature 19th century uh, crafts um, uh, of any kind, you're likely to find things made out of ivory. Um, this was a, a widely traded commodity, but again, this is a finite resource. Um, and as we're going to see with rubber in the Congo, uh, wild rubber, um, we read King Leopold's Ghost, uh, the frontier of, of ivory kept getting pushed back. The people would effectively kill all of the elephants in a region, and there would be no more supply of ivory, and so they would have to move further into the interior uh, to find more elephants. And so this kept getting pushed back further and further into, uh, into the interior of Africa. Um, and here we also, you know, as, as it gets pushed back, uh, the Arabs frequently had to work with African middlemen to, uh, who found the, found the ivory, killed the elephants, and extracted the ivory. Um, and that they would take it then to, toward the coast, probably to a trading center like Tabora or, or one of these places here, um, and trade it in the market there, and then it would be taken out to Zanzibar. Um, or Mombasa or one of these places and shipped into somewhere else, either north through the Red Sea and the Suez Canal to Europe, uh, into the Mediterranean, I should say, or, uh, you know, over here to the east, to the Raven Peninsula, or, you know, all the way over to India or someplace like that. Um, 
Though India was also a supplier of ivory, there are Asian elephants on the Indian subcontinent, and so it was in probably less demand there, um, more demand in, in Europe. So there were lots of opportunities for enrichment, both for the Arab traders who lived on the coast and increasingly penetrated the interior, and for Africans living in the interior um, uh, who, you know, could, with the use of firearms um, and their own military ingenuity, uh, carve out territories for themselves, defeat their, their neighbors, uh, enslave them, you know, kill elephants, take them to the coast, um, and trade with the Africa, sorry, trade with Arab traders. Um, and uh, they received in return more weapons, which increased their ability to, to uh, pursue these economic opportunities, or in some cases they, they received other goods. Cloth um, uh, was a, another important commodity traded here. Um, and they could either, you know, I mean, use cloth to, to enrich their own wardrobe or probably more commonly to trade uh, or, or bestow gifts upon their, uh, the, their retainers, their hangers-on, and thus, in typical African fashion, you know, gain power over people. Um, uh, and so, I mean, this is not out of sorts with the, sort of the kinds of economic opportunities that we talked about in the last class, except that slavery as an institution was increasing in this area rather than decreasing. Um, and, and I mean, not, not internal slavery so much as slavery uh, intended for export. Much of this gets disturbed. Uh, I've put the word rupture here, and I think that that's an appropriate term. Once the Europeans come in and take full control, um, installing their own colonial governments, that uh, many of the process of the processes of of economic dynamism that had um, prevailed in this part of Africa and get uh, disrupted, though not entirely, as we'll see, um, that there, there still is a good deal of creativity and dynamism after that. Okay, so just a few examples of these themes we're talking about. We already mentioned that the Portuguese Empire had extended here but had been pushed back um, uh, starting in the 17th century by these Muslim rulers, the sultans, uh, from Oman on the southern part of the Arabian Peninsula. And uh, for a time, um, now through the 18th century, these Omani sultans ruled parts of East Africa, uh, pushing the Portuguese all the way to the south again to, to Mozambique, ruled parts of Africa from Oman. Uh, but under the Sultan Said Said, uh, that sounds like a sounds like a made-up name, really. But uh, that was uh, the name that he he uh, either was given or, or chose for himself. Uh, he's the one pictured over here. Uh, this is Said Said. Um, uh, he decided to move his political capital from the Arabian Peninsula down to Zanzibar, and uh, this is the at the beginning of the 19th century, um, and uh, Said Said uh, would, um, the, he didn't give up Oman, um, he continued to rule Oman, but he did so from Zanzibar, rather, rather than uh, vice versa, rather than rule East Africa from Oman, he ruled Oman from, from East Africa. Um, after the death of Said, and, and Said Said is, is the one at least partially responsible for making Zanzibar into this economic powerhouse. Uh, it had already been a successful trading uh, area, um, but uh, the shift to the clove plantations and to making this the, the, the real political center of the whole, um, uh, the whole of East Africa um, uh, was really his doing. This was, you know, in the 1820s and 1830s that, that he was operating. When he died in 1856, uh, the rulers of Zanzibar uh, broke from their counterparts in Oman, and Zanzibar became independent of Oman. Uh, 
Uh, effectively, Said Said's uh, kingdom, his empire, was split into two. And one of his heirs took over Oman, the other one took over Zanzibar. Um, and although there were still close relations between the two, this was no longer this massive empire. Um, and uh, Zanzibar continued to be a dominant force in, in East Africa, really up until the European partition of, uh, of Africa in the 1880s, which we'll discuss in a later class. Uh, initially, and really going all the way back into the Middle Ages, um, the Arab traders had worked with African middlemen. In fact, they, they in those, those previous centuries, had confined themselves almost entirely to the coast. But uh, they recognized the utility, um, the desirability of having a permanent presence in the interior. And so this was piecemeal. It was something that didn't happen all at once. Uh, but they initially sent Arab traders from the coast into the interior and, and set up uh, residence in some of the larger villages in the interior. And over time, these grew to be major trading centers. And uh, under Said, Said and others in the 19th century, um, they were eventually kind of taken over by the sultans of, of Zanzibar. Uh, I mentioned a couple of these already, um, Tabora and Ujiji. Uh, Tabora, um, kind of on the border between uh, Kenya and Tanzania. Actually, I think it's into Tanzania. Um, but uh, And then Ujiji, which is right on Lake Tanganyika. Um, and there's this, there was this whole trading network that ran through these cities of the interior. Um, the other major trade center was Buganda. Now we're going to talk more about Buganda. This is one of the more uh, important kingdoms of the Great Lakes region. Uh, you may note the commonality with the name uh, Uganda, the modern nation of Uganda, and um, much of the territory which is now Uganda was part of the kingdom of Buganda. Uh, which has its origins all the way back in the 17th century. Buganda was still a major power right on the northern shore of Lake Victoria, extending uh, north to some extent. And uh, Arab, trader, Arab traders in this, in this era um, reached Buganda and introduced firearms into Buganda. They hadn't existed there previously, and from there into other kingdoms like Bunyoro and uh, Rwanda and places like that that we will discuss uh, here in a couple of slides. Um, and these Arab traders who were connected to Zanzibar uh, came to have a permanent presence in Buganda. Now, they didn't take over Buganda, um, unlike what they had done in, in places like Ujiji and Tabora. These were not controlled uh, as part of a network of trading centers. Uh, the Arab merchants who, who inhabited Buganda and worked out of Buganda had to uh, capitulate to the demands of the Kabakas, uh, who were the rulers of Buganda. Um, but there was a permanent Arab uh, Zanzibari presence there. Maybe the best example of one of these um, coastal Arab merchants who found great wealth uh, and great opportunity by penetrating the interior, it went by the name Tipu Tip. Now that name was, uh, this, is, this is not his real name, uh, this was kind of his nickname or, I don't know, his alter ego, if, uh, if you will. Um, his name was Hamid bin Muhammad, um, a typical kind of Arab Muslim name. Uh, but Tipu Tip, who is pictured here, uh, this is Tipu Tip, one of the one of the few photographs actually taken of this guy, had a prosperous career that spanned uh, something like a dozen years, where he collected mercenary soldiers uh, with the support of the the sultans of Zanzibar. Uh, penetrated, and, and this is in the. Um, uh, the 1850s and 60s, I believe. Um, but he penetrated the interior um, and in, in some ways carved out kind of a, a, a kingdom for himself. Um, working out of these trading centers, he uh, was a, a 
significant figure uh, politically um, in the area, uh, had a lot of men in arms underneath him, and all with the, the goal of extracting as many slaves and as much ivory as he could from the interior. Tipu Tip was a kind of was somewhat of an adventurer. Uh, he traveled far and wide in East Africa um, and gained fabulous wealth, which he then invested in clove plantations on Zanzibar. Uh, once the uh, uh, the Belgians had laid claim to this area and began to set up a colonial system uh, in the 1880s, Tipu Tip retired, 1870s, 1880s. Tipu Tip retired uh, to his plantations in Zanzibar and lived out his life as probably one of the wealthiest men in all of Africa. Um, so that's a, you know, it's a, a fairly uh, successful example, but not out of the norm necessarily, at least, uh, you know, Tipu Tip uh, signified what so many of these coastal Arab merchants wanted to do with themselves, and that is to you know, gain a, a permanent presence, a, a kind of monopoly on trade from the interior, uh, not having to work through African middlemen, um, and uh, uh, establishing themselves that way. Um, I may have more to say about him in the, in the context of the Great Lakes region uh, in a few minutes here. And so, with the expansion of these merchants, this allowed the Zanzibari sultans to uh, sort of declare that they were the ruler over this whole network of trading cities and to establish a real hegemony over parts of East Africa, a kind of land-based empire. Sorry, I, again, I didn't get enough sleep last night. Um, uh, a land-based empire that, uh, that extended through much of, much of East Africa. Um, further than really the, the political reach of East Africa here, or of the Zanzibar sultans. Um, so you can see some of the things we've been talking about here. Um, you know, here's Zanzibar, and there was this kind of major trade route that ran into the interior to Tabora and all the way over to Ujiji on Lake Tanganyika. And from there, uh, you know, it went south down here, uh, and also north, um, and ran through a territory dominated people by a people called the Nyamwezi, uh, who would often hire themselves out as mercenaries to the um, to the Arabs, um, and who were in in some cases expansionists themselves under the leadership of uh, uh, Mirambo, who we'll talk about in a minute here. The Nyamwezi kind of carved out a, a small interior kingdom uh, in the middle of the 19th century, uh, but but those are the trade routes, right? Now, one of those trade routes ran up here into uh, onto the western shore of Lake Victoria and all the way here into the kingdom of Buganda. Now I'm going to talk about a few of these kingdoms um, yeah, in a moment here. Uh, these are, you know, th these are not new to this era. Uh, some of these date back into the 17th century. Um, uh, so they've been around for a while. Um, but uh, we have these large kingdoms here in, in you know, the uh, right between Lake Tanganyika and Lake Victoria, and to some extent up here uh, between Lake Victoria and Lake Albert. Um, the Great Lakes region is perhaps the most fertile agricultural region of all of Africa, with the possible exception of the northern coast um, uh, on the Mediterranean where Algeria and Tunisia are. Um, and so this area, uh, can sustain and has historically been able to sustain a much larger population than other regions of Africa. The land is extremely fertile. Uh, the climate is actually not not so bad, even though this is very close to the equator. Much of this is in highland areas. Uh, the elevation is is well elevated, and uh, and so it's a bit cooler um, up here uh, than it is certainly on the coast. Um, and uh, rainfall is very high in the Great Lakes region, and of course they have these freshwater lakes uh, that serve as a ready means of, well, water supply and also um, transportation. Uh, and, uh, and, and so this is a unique region of Africa um, 
And so the populations, this is the part of Africa, the part of sub-Saharan Africa, that uh, was able to develop cities. Um, even, you know, several centuries previous to this era we're talking about. Um, I don't want to, you know, don't want you to envision a, a modern Western style, style city here, but uh, population centers that were significant in size, much bigger than the kind of standard homestead nucleated villages that marked most of, of Africa. Uh, probably settlements similar in size to the um, uh, to the major cities of the Sahelian region along the Niger River um, in West Africa, uh, places like Jene and Timbuktu, uh, West Africa, or sorry, East Africa here in the Great Lakes region had uh, these kinds of population centers. Um, the kingdoms, uh, so let me skip over to this, this next bullet point here, and I'll come back to this one about kings and provincial chiefs. Um, and so we have, and I mean, just to recount some of these, um, Uganda was a major kingdom, started in the 17th century here on the northern shore of Lake Victoria. Predating that to some extent was uh, an area to the north and west, which was dominated by a kingdom known as Bunyoro. Um, this one may run all the way back even to the early 17th century. I can't remember exactly the uh, the dates of this, and uh, it was thought that the Buganda was probably a break off of Bunyoro uh, at some point later in the 17th century. Um, we also have other, uh, other smaller kingdoms further to the south and, and west, and Kore, uh, Karagwe, and then um, the having the same names as modern nations over here, uh, Rwanda and Burundi. Um, and it probably was the case that a lot of uh, political ideas, political forms, uh, as well as trade, uh, circulated among these kingdoms. Um, the political theory behind these kingdoms, the justification they gave, had to do with a process known as ethnogenesis. This is, of course, a, a term that has been applied by anthropologists and historians to talk about this, but... Um, effectively, these kings created a mythology, um, an ancestry that gave some sanction to them as kings. They invented a lineage, in other words. And some of this was probably based in real historical fact, but some of it almost certainly was made up. In Buganda, which was probably the most powerful of all of these kingdoms, and in other kingdoms, it seems, uh, there was not a smooth succession process. It didn't necessarily pass from father to son. Uh, succession often, ha often happened via violence, and this to some extent did destabilize this, these kingdoms. But, you know, if you have a powerful king who manages to fight off all of his rivals and establish his authority, uh, that, that can be a pretty effective king. If he's got a powerful army and has enough charisma to keep his soldiers in line, um, you know, you can actually have a fairly successful, fairly long-lived king. This can, of course, go terribly awry if the violent succession process doesn't work out and, and nobody uh, comes to full power. Um, but, uh, and, and so there were probably fluctuations uh, over the course of time in the political stability of these kingdoms. In fact, there's, there's not a, any probably about it. There was great fluctuation. Um, the kings kept their power over people by connecting the concept of privilege to the person of the king. That the king became the one who bestowed, for instance, titles and other honors uh, also, in some cases, land or luxury goods uh, on their um, loyal retainers, people who had proven themselves. And so there's a whole system of privilege that developed around these kings that was tied into the mythology uh, of ancestry, the ethnogenesis, the creation of, uh, of the, the kind of conceptual creation of the people. 
Uh, privilege was reinforced by taxation, that um, those who were in power, those who had privilege, had the ability to tax uh, the peasant farmers uh, who lived underneath them. Uh, and even though some of these people did pack up and move, as was common in Africa, uh, they often, um, well, I mean, they were either coerced or incentivized to remain in place. Um, there were also systems of tribute given to the kings and other nobles uh, to reinforce their identity as the rulers and the dominant figures in the society. Now, one of the, uh, in some of these kingdoms, and this is especially the case further down here into Rwanda and Burundi, um, the pastoralists, who were probably, no, not probably, who were the minority uh, were given privilege over the agriculturalists. Um, so those who raised cattle, and this is partly because cattle was the most identifiable source of wealth in this period. Um, this region doesn't have, I mean, they didn't necessarily use precious metals uh, or other um, uh, rare objects like cowrie shells, um, uh, actually, I'm not sure whether cowrie shells had penetrated this part of the African interior at this point. They were in use as a currency in other parts of Africa. Um, but, uh, you know, through, through this region and you know, further south into uh, southern Africa, cattle really was the, the standard of wealth, that a person counted their wealth and to some extent their, their status in, the, in society uh, by the number of cattle they had. Um, and so, in this whole system of privilege and tribute and taxation and everything, uh, those who were pastoralists often were given privilege because they had cattle. They had identify an identifiable source of wealth. Um, and because they were in the minority, more people were farmers than cattle raisers, um, at least those who could rely entirely on raising cattle then this group of pastoralists came to constitute a kind of nobility or a privileged minority. Now, in Rwanda and Burundi, um, and I think further west over here into beyond Lake Kivu here, uh, these people existed as well, but the pastoralists came to be known as the Tutsi, and the agriculturalists as the Hutu. Now, you know, uh, if you know anything about those ethnic identifications, you will know that these are the two groups who were the uh, perpetrators and victims, largely, that's, that's oversimplifying things, but largely, of the Rwandan genocide in 1994. Um, and the tension between the Hutu and Tutsi had been building for a long time, for several decades before the Rwandan genocide. And you might be tempted to think, okay, well, you know, these are tribes. These are ethnic identities that uh, have existed for a very long time. Um, but that's not necessarily the case. There were people who were identified as Hutu and Tutsi in the 19th century and probably even in periods before this. Um, but those meant, those had, rather than being uh, kind of permanent ethnic identifications, they were used with reference to the the livelihood or the profession that these people engaged in. And the categories, moreover, were fluid. There wasn't necessarily a shame uh, component if a Tutsi, who was a, a pastoralist uh, who owned a lot of cattle, would marry a Hutu, for instance. Um, that that was not forbidden at all. And uh, people would pass, depending on the vicissitudes of climate and uh, and market forces and other things. Uh, you know, one generation they might be pastoralists and then their cattle might die of disease and they would be forced to take up the agricultural lifestyle uh, or they might have a bumper crop um, of grain or something like that and they could afford to buy some cattle such that they came to identify as Tutsi. Uh, and these categories, again, were highly fluid. People moved in and out of them um, you know, even over the course of a single lifetime, one might be a Hutu for a while and then become a Tutsi. They were not hard and fast categories. And that's important to, uh, that's important to understand um, when we talk about the 19th century legacy uh, going forward and the way that this is then 
you know, the pre-existing structures like this are taken by the Europeans and and corrupted uh, to some extent, um, as was the case with the Hutu and Tutsi. So we'll return to a discussion of these two groups uh, later in the course. Um, a couple of other terms here that we've, I think, already introduced. Mercantilism is the connection between political power and economic might, uh, where the, those who are in political power largely dominate the economic forces. And all of these kingdoms attempted to do that. All of these major states uh, were really mercantile states. Buganda, for instance, had um, kind of a stranglehold on the trade in and out of the kingdom, that even though there were Arab merchants residents in the, the, the towns, uh, the larger settlements of Buganda, they were limited in their activities and all of the um, economic activities had to be done under the auspices and with the permission of the king or the Kabaka as he was known uh, in Buganda. And similar structures, similar uh, uh, conceptualizations existed in the other kingdoms here. With the introduction of firearms, these states also became highly expansionist and, and militaristic uh, and this led them to fight with each other. Um, though this did also, in some cases, destabilize them internally. Now, out of, out, outside of these large kingdoms, if you go further, so let me, let's look at the map here. If you go further to the east over here, uh, you'll find, you know, people like the Nyamwezi or the Maasai um, or uh, the Kikuyu, um, which are all you know, groups uh, who inhabit what is now Kenya and Tanzania and some of the countries of the Great Lakes region. Well, these people in the 19th century were belonged to localized polities um, rather than having any kind of connection with these significant kingdoms, either of the coast or of the Great Lakes region. Uh, and so, in other words, uh, these people were far more in the African norm than these these major kingdoms were, um, historically speaking, anyway. Uh, what dominated their lives? Well, um, disputes over land and water. The further east you go from the uh, from the Great Lakes region, the drier it gets. Um, and so these people are still farmers, but the resources are more scarce. The rainfall is not as predictable and, and dependable. Um, and so disputes would arise over such things. And this led many of them not necessarily to abandon agriculture entirely, but at least to diversify their, uh, their professional activities, as it were, and become involved in trade and also in warfare as middlemen or as mercenaries working largely for uh, the... Sultan of Zanzibar. Um, probably the most prolific of all of these were the Nyamwezi people. And again, if we go back to that last one, you can see that in, the Nyamwezi um, were in this area kind of south of Lake Victoria um, and east of Lake Tanganyika, um, the, the key trading center that was surrounded by Nyam, uh, territory of the Nyamwezi was Tabora, and eventually that's going to become a, a key center of a a small and fairly short-lived but still important kingdom of the Nyamwezi. And so these people were manipulated, as we could say, by the Arabs of the coast. Uh, in some cases they were conquered and, and ruled outright by them. Uh, the Arabs tended to divide uh, these people. They would hire one group. Uh, so for instance, the Nyamwezi and also the Maasai had a reputation for being fearsome warriors, and so they would be co-opted by the by the sultans of Zanzibar and, you know, um, used in raiding expeditions to, uh, uh, to take slaves and uh, also, you know, used as hunters to uh, seek out elephants and try to extract ivory. Um, and people like Tipu Tip, for instance, uh, you know, would hire Nyamwezi or hire Maasai uh, to do his dirty work for, for him. Another key and we haven't talked about this yet. This will be in the next lecture where we discuss this in some detail. Uh, but there was a, a, a sequence of events in southern Africa 
um, in the first two or three decades of the 19th century. Uh, this sequence of events is known collectively as the Mfekane. Um, don't worry about that term at this point. I will have much more to say about that in the, in the next lecture. Uh, but um, th this started among the people known as the Nguni people. This is a, a sort of sub-branch of the Bantu uh, language group. Um, there are several languages included among the Nguni. Uh, but this started with the Zulu and uh, the Zulu who conquered a lot of territory and pushed people into other regions. Uh, who then destabilized those regions, and we have this kind of domino effect all in, in southern Africa. Um, well, some of these groups of Nguni people who were victims of the Umfekane, of these massive wars uh, and destabilizing processes going on further to the south, ended up moving, migrating all the way to the north, to the area around Lake Malawi. Now, these were people who had been you know, migrants to southern Africa, out of East Africa, many centuries previously, spoke a different language, really pursued, in many cases, a different lifestyle uh, with different values than the peoples of East Africa. Um, they had come from a different topographic and demographic context than this. Um, and so, in other words, they, they were very different people. Well, they, you know, fleeing the chaos of the Umfekane, ended up in East Africa in fairly large numbers, again around Lake Malawi, um, in largely in what is now the country of Malawi. Uh, and this led to a disruption of trade. Um, uh, these people who had, uh, these Nguni people had borrowed military tactics from the Zulu uh, under their pioneering uh, military king Shaka, um, and they introduced these military innovations into East Africa, uh, which led some, I mean, which, which also created some disruption and some chaos. Uh, and the, the lifestyle and especially the, um, the, the military organization of the Nguni began to be imitated by people um, all over East Africa who, were, who had expansionist ideas. Um, and uh, this led, among other sequelae, or among other um, results of the Nguni incursion, were the appearance of kind of roving bands of young mercenary men uh, called by the pejorative name Ruga Ruga. Now, there are lots of stories told about the Ruga Ruga, um, these were not people from any one single ethnicity, uh, but uh, to some extent these groups of Ruga Ruga again, imitated the age regiment systems and other things uh, of the Nguni. Some of them probably included Nguni people, uh, but really these are kind of roving mercenary bands for hire. Uh, we also have stories about them, you know, um, smoking cannabis and, and using cannabis as a kind of major feature of their identity. Um, and so, you know, we have the 19th century African drug culture here, I suppose, or something like that. Uh, but these Ruga Ruga created further disruption, and, and uh, disruption in some cases can lead to opportunities for those who are enterprising and willing to, uh, uh, to, to try to profit off of the chaos. And, and one of the chief beneficiaries of this whole kind of chaotic experience was the Nyamwezi military chieftain Mirambo. Now this is the guy pictured on the slide here. Um, this, is a, this is a photograph taken of Mirambo. Uh, Mirambo managed to unite many of these bands of Ruga Ruga under the banner of the Nyamwezi. Now this, this is a good example to show how fluid these ethnic categories were. Right? These are not hard and fast uh, irrevocable identities. People, you know, would, you know, sort of try on different identities like this, like trying on a new pair of shoes or putting a new case on their smartphone or something like that. I don't want to be too flippant about this, but, uh, but there is a great deal of fluidity, uh, you know, previous to the 20th century, um, when these things actually become more crystallized. But previous to the 20th century, great deal of fluidity in these ethnic identifications. Mirambo 
uh, united the united the Nyamwezi people or people who are willing to uh, be part of the uh, the group of the Nyamwezi, whether they came ancestrally from that or not, and to carve out a, a small um, mercantilist and militarist kingdom um, centered on the um, well, as we see, centered kind of on the town of Tabora here. Um, uh, and so, you know, the, the, the small kingdom and fairly short-lived kingdom of Mirambo was here. Uh, so, so this is the the, the potential that existed uh, for political unity uh, th that was seized upon by Mirambo. Uh, his kingdom, if we can even call it that, his, you know, his hegemony um, did not really outlive his death, and the Nyamwezi continued to be a fairly fluid group of people, but some... Um, you know, under Mirambo for a couple of decades in the second half of the 19th century, uh, they achieved significant uh, uh, political hegemony. Um, and uh, Mirambo and his, and his soldiers um, probably were responsible for extracting thousands, maybe tens of thousands of slaves from, uh, from the interior of Africa, trading them with the Arabs on the coast. Um, uh, but his goal was not just to get rich, but also to have political leadership, and, and he succeeded in doing that. Um, we already talked about Tipu Tip. Uh, this is another you know, example of an enterprising person who could seize upon the chaos uh, inherent in this era, in this region, with all of these destabilizing factors and um, uh, grow quite wealthy off of this by... Uh, by hiring mercenaries, by engaging in a variety of economic activities, extracting slaves, extracting ivory, uh, trading with the people of the interior, conquering some, uh, and enslaving their populations, and you know, doing a, a variety of things like that. Um, one of the most well, and the leaders of these large kingdoms. Uh, began to, well, they imitated to some extent what people like Tipu Tip and Mirambo were doing um, under the leadership of two fairly long-lived Kabakas um, of the kingdom of Buganda, Suna, who ruled from, what, 18... Uh, got this in my notes here. 1820, I want to say. Um, maybe 1830. I think it's 1830 to 1857. Yeah, that's right. 1830 to 1857. And then under Mutesa, uh, who ruled also for 27 years, 1857 to 1884, um, these Ganda, uh, you know, hired mercenaries um, and took advantage of the of the destabilization. Um, they also worked um, at times trading with people like Mirambo and Tipu Tip, um, and so the Ganda, you know, were able to to carve out a place for themselves in this whole um, in this whole system of militarism and mercantilism. Um, though they were facing uh, problems that they hadn't necessarily faced before. Now, I will say about the Kingdom of Buganda that th there were among the privileged nobility many who didn't like uh, who, who were trying to strip power away from the Kabaka and toward the end of the 19th century they succeeded in doing this by converting to Christianity many of them and uh, they began to use their Christianity as an excuse to no longer obey the commands of the Kabaka uh, to declare their independence to state that they were uh, as Christians they were not beholden to uh, the, uh, the loyalty um, uh, to the Kabaka, that their chief loyalty was to God, and this uh, infusion of, of Christianity among the, the, the nobility or the ruling elites of uh, Buganda, um, especially after the death of Mutesa, proved to, be, um, proved to be catastrophic for Buganda and allowed Buganda to be uh, colonized by the Europeans. And so we see all through this era both the dynamism, uh, the dynamism of people like Mirambo or Tipu Tip or the, uh, these uh, successful Kabakas of Buganda, uh, 
but also the potential weaknesses of this whole system. That this, uh, you know, one of the commonalities among Africa is that this is not a place that produces large hegemonies uh, that tends toward unity on a mass scale. Um, and with all of the, the destabilizing factors, uh, those tendencies would expose themselves quite frequently. Um, and this, you know, served to, uh, to, to break up hegemonies and, um, you know, led because people were not unified. They were conquered by, uh, by charismatic and successful entrepreneurs like Midambo or Tip or Tip, um, enslaved and sent off to the coast and potentially shipped up into the Persian Gulf or something like that. Okay, at this point I would ask if there are questions about the Great Lakes region, but since this is an online lecture, um, you'll have to ask your questions on the discussion boards. And please do ask questions. That's one of the, uh, one of the key ways uh, of participating in the discussion boards. Uh, I want to end this lecture by talking about Ethiopia. Um, of all the regions of Africa, this, is, this one is unique, uh, and this one is... In some ways, I, mean, it's, I think it's tremendously interesting. Um, so we're talking here about, I mean, some, some people call this northeastern Africa. Uh, I don't know. It's really kind of the northeastern part of sub-Saharan Africa, so maybe that is an accurate thing. Um, but uh, until the 19th century, now, what we have to realize about the Kingdom of Ethiopia is that this is an ancient thing. It's been around, uh, well, really all the way back to about the first century CE. Um, with the rise of uh, the kingdom of Aksum or Meroe. Um, uh, well, I mean, Aksum is actually a bit to the north, but the, um, uh, the kingdom of Meroe, uh, and then with the conversion um, of many of the Ethiopian people to Christianity in the 4th century, uh, Ethiopia came to have a Christian identity, and the kings of Ethiopia, or the emperors of Ethiopia, as they're otherwise known, um, had this very strong Christian identity uh, in the Middle Ages under the Zagwe dynasty and eventually under, um, uh, well, the, what was known as the Solomonic dynasty. Um, uh, the identity of the rulers became very closely tied with this unique version of, which is kind of a, uh, a fusion of Christianity and Judaism. Um, uh, the idea that the ruler of Ethiopia was a direct descendant of King Solomon, um, with emphasis very much on the Old Testament parts of the Christian religion, still a belief in Jesus as the Son of God, but emphasizing a lot of uh, Jewish features. May, this may have had to do with the fact that there were a lot of uh, African Jews, or Falashas as they're known, living in the region, and they may have you know, had an impact on the way Christianity was observed. Um, but, uh, the, uh, the rulers had, had retained this strong Christian slash Jewish identity as the, as the heirs of the ancient King Solomon. Uh, there's also a belief in Ethiopian Christianity that the, uh, the actual Ark of the Covenant from ancient Judaism, uh, was not found by Indiana Jones, but was in fact, um, taken uh, delivered by God to the Ethiopian people, and the, this is kept kind of under lock and key by priests in the Ethiopian church. Um, well, during the Middle Ages, several of the, the rulers, um, the Zagwe and the Solomonic dynasties, uh, had established significant hegemony um, and, and were powerful rulers over Ethiopia. Much of that had fallen apart in the 16th and 17th and 18th centuries as these dynasties declined significantly um, and as people, the Oromo from the south and other peoples, uh, Muslim, uh, Muslim converts from the coast had begun to threaten parts of Ethiopia. And so um, by the 18th century, Ethiopia was divided up into a kind of confederation of, of smaller regional powers. I'll mention three here, um, and I, I wish we had a map in front of us. There are maps in the textbook uh, that you can look at um, to get a sense of this. But um, in the northern part of Ethiopia is a region called Tigray, um, which had been the seat of the Solomonic dynasty and retained uh, an importance politically and uh, culturally. 
um, in the central part of the Ethiopian highlands was a, a region known as Amhara. This is where the Amharic language comes from. And uh, this had also been an important center. But increasingly, uh, to the south, in the region known as Shoa, S-H-O-A, um, there were powerful kind of princes uh, or kings ruling over that territory um, who uh, inserted themselves in major ways into Ethiopian affairs. And so through the 18th century, really into the middle of the 19th century, um, an era that is known, uh, I talked about the Oromo migrations already, which was a, another destabilizing factor. Uh, this, this era is known from the, the middle of the 18th to the middle of the 19th century, is known in Amharic um, as the Zemene Mesafint, which means the age of the princes. Uh, this era when Ethiopia was dominated not by a centralized authority under the person of the emperor, but rather under the, uh, uh, the regional rule of these regional princes. Now, if Ethiopia was going to become united again, it had to happen probably through one of these regional rulers. And in fact, that's exactly what happened. Um, uh, the first of these to, to reunify Ethiopia after the end of the Zemene Mesafint was uh, Theodros II. This is the guy pictured here on the slide. Uh, he is in some ways the, uh, the modern father of the Ethiopian state, uh, but he managed to claim the title of emperor. He was from Tigray uh, in the north. And Theodros is important for a number of reasons. Uh, you can read about him more in the textbook, but he was the first of the Ethiopian rulers to attempt to modernize the country, uh, probably taking his cues from Muhammad Ali Pasha, who we will talk about um, uh, later on in the class, in a couple of lectures, um, but uh, he uh, also, I mean, Ethiopians had contact with people in Europe due to their common Christianity, um, and he saw the need to uh, modernize, to industrialize, and particularly to procure modern style weapons in order to bring some sort of unity to the country via military means. Uh, so Theodros was a, a significant modernizer. Now, the other ambition that he had was to take the coast, the, the Red Sea coast, which historically, and I'm talking here ancient history, going all the way back into the ancient era, uh, historically had been part of Ethiopia, or part of the ancient kingdom of Meroe. Um, having access to the coast would mean that Ethiopia was not landlocked, of course, and they could have a lot more economic opportunity via the coastal ports of Massawa and other, other things. Um, so Ethiopia was trying to take over the region known as Eritrea, which was predominantly a Muslim region, um, at times under the hegemony of various rulers of the Arabian Peninsula, uh, at times more uh, uh, disunified. Um, now Theodros was facing uh, and, and the thing that ultimately was served to be his undoing um, was that uh, he was facing tendencies of decentralization. Princes, local rulers, nobles who wanted to maintain their independence. Um, and uh, uh, some of these regional rulers began to appeal for outside help against the centralizing uh, tendencies of Theodros, and, and uh, through these means Theodros ran afoul of the British, and after he insulted uh, the British by arresting some of uh, some British soldiers who probably were there to help one of these regional princes in their complaints against Theodros, uh, he held these, these men captive, the British sent an expeditionary force um, to try to rescue these people uh, at great cost to the British taxpayer. And uh, the British military um, uh, uh, penetrated the interior of Ethiopia, and uh, Theodros, rather than be captured by the British and taken back to, to London as a prisoner, decided to commit suicide. His son was um, captured and taken back, um, and... Uh, I want to make sure I have this right here. Um, uh, yeah, 
yeah, the, the British did take his son back and uh, tried to you know, raise him as a, as a British boy. He actually died when he was fairly young. Um, and uh, the, the local prince of Tigray, uh, so that's the British incursion, Local prince of Tigray, Johannes IV, then seized power as the um, the emperor of Ethiopia, and once again um, was the you know sought these, these to, to centralize and unify the country. Also sought access to the coast and fought a series of wars against the coastal peoples to try to uh, to take control of that region. This brought him into conflict with the Egyptians. Uh, initially, but later on, uh, by the 1880s, the Italians, after the partition of Africa, which we'll talk about later in the course, uh, the Italians took over the Eritrean coast, and uh, Johannes ended up picking a fight with the Italians. Um, Johannes died suddenly in um, uh, 1889 as he was fighting against the forces of the Mahdi uh, in the Sudan. Now, this is a We'll talk about who the Mahdi was later on, uh, but he fought against the Ethiopians. Uh, Johannes led his army uh, into battle against the Mahdi and, and was killed. Um, and so at this point, the most powerful of all of the regional princes, who was the, the king of Shoah uh, to the south, uh, Menelik became the emperor. And really, Menelik was the one who completed the modernization process. Maybe the wisest thing that Menelik decided to do was to um, abandon the quest to take power of, uh, over the coast. Uh, Menelik's finest hour came in 1896. Um, after he managed to procure uh, a good amount of modern weapons, uh, he armed his soldiers uh, and produced really Afri well, one of Africa's first modernized armies. Uh, and the Italians sent an, an expeditionary force into the interior, uh, into the Ethiopian highlands, to try to exert hegemony over Ethiopia. Um, this was something that they felt they had a right to because, you know, Ethiopia was, was Christian and Italy was the center of the Catholic Church, and so it made sense to them, and they justified this to their European counterparts and were effectively given a green light to attempt to do this. Um, so the Italians attacked Ethiopia, and the forces of Menelik, armed with modern weapons, uh, beat, beat the Italians. Um, actually beat them quite resoundingly in the Battle of Adwa in 1896. And Ethiopia was, um, uh, rather the Italians abandoned their, their quest at this point to try to gain control over Ethiopia. Um, and so uh, this led to the recognition on the part, even of many European powers, of the sovereignty and independence of Ethiopia. Of all of the areas of Africa, Ethiopia was really the, well, one of the only regions, Liberia was another, um, but one of the only countries that was acknowledged as sovereign and independent. Now we're going to see later in the, in the 1930s, uh, under Mussolini, the Italians are going to come back. Um, all of this is part of, you know, the lead up to the Second World War uh, and take control of Ethiopia for just a few years. Um, but they were thwarted in their, in their efforts to do this before. And so Ethiopia is a, a great success story in that regard. Okay, well, this lecture has run on um, somewhat long uh, at this point. My apologies for that. Uh, there's a lot of material to cover here, though. Um, and uh, hopefully you've learned something from this. So uh, I will um, see you in the next lecture where we'll talk about um, Southern Africa.